You remember um, when you were in school and the teacher would stand up at some point in the middle of the class and say, guess what? Pop quiz. You remember that? You hate that, don't you? <laughs> guess what? Pop quiz. Put your Bibles away for just a second because we're going to have a little Bible pop quiz this morning. But if you're anxious, I want you to just relax a little bit because it's only two questions and they are relatively easy, or at least I think so. All right? So are you ready? Here we go. Question number one. And you can just yell it out if you think you know the answer. Who can tell me how many books there are in the Bible? Just yell it out. 66. Very good. Kind of. Actually, it depends on which Bible you're looking at, doesn't it? Yeah. Because if, you look at a, if, you look at the, if you're looking at a Catholic Bible, what you will discover is that there's actually 73 books in the Catholic Bible. You see, they, well, so where did these uh, seven other books come from? Well, they are known as the Apocrypha or the Intertestamental books. And somewhere during the Res Reformation, um, those books were taken out of the Protestant Bible, which deserves a whole sermon series on its own, which I'm not going to give you today. So let's just move on to an easier question, all right? Question number two. And this one, this one it really is easier, I think. How many commandments are there? Just yell it out. Ten. Randy, you said twelve. So what are you thinking? Oh, very good. So you're thinking the Ten Commandments plus the two that we, uh, that Paige read, right? Wrong! <laughs> Actually, if you look just at the first five books of the Bible, does anybody want to know what the first five books of the Bible are called? They're called the Torah, right. In the first five books of the Bible, there are 613 commandments in just the first five books of the Bible. Hmm. And then I'm gonna, here's, here's a little something that maybe you, you didn't know, that on top of those, just those 613 that are in the first five books of the Bible, there are hundreds and hundreds of other commandments that are called, that are often referred to as fence commandments. And these were commandments that came, that were uh, established, I guess, or laid out there for people by the rabbis. And the purpose of a fence commandment was just what it sounds like. It was to create a kind of a spiritual fence to keep people far enough away from even getting close to breaking the 613 commandments that are in the first five books of the Bible. So, I'll give you an example of a fence commandment. Um, we know one of, the, one of the big ten is to keep the Sabbath day holy, right? Keep the Sabbath day holy. Um, so, a fence commandment was that the rabbis came up with a fence commandment saying, uh, the, best, the best way to keep you all in a place where you can keep the Sabbath day holy is to make sure that you, that you stay home on the Sabbath. Except unless you're going to worship, if you're going to temple. If you're going to temple, it's okay. But as soon as temple's over with, you go back home and you stay home until the Sabbath is over from Friday night to Saturday night. You stay home, you don't have any problems. Right? But, imagine this. Let's say you're a Jewish farmer. I shared this with some of you guys the other day. Let's say you're a Jewish farmer, and you've went to temple one Sabbath, and on the way home, you look out in the backyard, and you realize, oh shoot, my donkey is stuck in the mud. You see, technically... If you were to go out and free your donkey from the mud, you would be breaking at least the fence commandment and theoretically you'd be breaking the, the big commandment. Keep the Sabbath day holy. So what are you supposed to do? Well, the rabbis, because they apparently love donkeys, said, here's another fence commandment for you. If you can find a length of rope that would stretch between your doorstep to wherever it is that your donkey is stuck in the mud, you tie one end of the rope to your doorstep, the other end of your rope to your waist, and you go out and you set that donkey free. And voila, you have not broken any of the commandments. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. But look, the point is, life is complicated, isn't it? And it's nuanced. 
And if you're going to cover all the potentialities, you got to have all these rules and regulations, don't you? Or do you? You see, that's the way we human beings deal with all the potentialities, don't we? And it's not just when it comes to religion. We do this in life. We try to come up with all kinds of laws. Every time something happens that we don't like, we just think, well, we got to come up with another rule or another law, right? And that will solve that problem until the next problem. That's what we do as human beings. It's just a natural response to, what, to the complexities or the nuance of life. But what if I were to tell you that there is actually a better and simpler way. Would you be interested? I hope so. Because the fact of the matter is, if we as human beings continue down this road, all these 613 commandments plus all the other hundreds of fence commandments plus all the laws and, and rules and regulations, there's no end to it. It'll, it'll, it would fill library after library. For those of you who may be guests or visitors with us, we have been here at Prairie Bible Church for a while, been in a sermon series entitled The Marks of Discipleship. And as you know, those of you that have been around, the marks of discipleship are basically those things that the Bible teaches will, that will help us to grow, to become the followers of Christ that God wants us to be. Well, this morning, we're going to take a look at a scripture a passage and some history that will make all of this a lot more simple. Perhaps even simple enough that people like you and me can understand. All right? So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up now to Matthew chapter 22. And as you're doing that, I'm going to share a little history and context with you because you need to know this history in order to understand this simple story. In Matthew chapter 22... Jesus is in a conversation with a Jewish lawyer. And what you need to know about this Jewish lawyer is that he was a member of a group of people that was trying to gather information that they could use against Jesus. Because Jesus was at a particular point in his, in his life and in his ministry where he, he was becoming more and more popular and he was becoming more and more powerful, which threatened the powerful, if you know what I mean. The, the, the religious leaders and the political leaders of the day could see him. His, it was like a snowball rolling down hill. His, he was just getting more and more popular, more and more powerful, and they thought they needed to put a stop to it. So this, this Jewish lawyer was sent in to, to try to th help do that. And he, he begins by asking what seems like a very innocent and simple question. He comes to Jesus and, and he says in Matthew twenty two thirty five, 35, he says, Jesus, can you tell us what is the greatest commandment? Now, again, when most of the time before today, you've probably read that passage of Scripture and went, well, that's, that's not that big a deal, right? Because we were thinking Ten Commandments, right? And none of them seem to be terribly um, controversial, so how, what, what could, what's the big deal? But remember, it wasn't 10 commandments. It was 613 commandments plus all the fence commandments, but I have no idea how many of those are. And this is what had happened. Because some people preferred or gave more authority to this set of fence commandments and, and Torah commandments than this set of Fence commandments and Torah commandments, that there had literally begun to be political factions that had gathered around the particular set of commandments that you liked the best. So this was what the, the Jewish lawyer was thinking. If I can pin him down, get him to say which one he thinks he likes the best, he's going to alienate all these people over here, right? This, all these political parties over here who have their preferences, he's going to alienate them and it's kind of divide and conquer. That's pretty smart. The problem with his plan was that Jesus is smarter because Jesus is God. And he knew exactly what was going on. And Jesus has this beautiful thing about him. Jesus has the ability to 
It's like a superpower. And it's not even supernatural, but it, it is super. He has this ability to make the complex understandable. If you ever find someone who has the ability to make the complex understandable, you'll discover that they have a lot of influence. Because that's what people are looking for, right? They're just, help me to understand. That was Jesus. He, he had that in spades. So he looks at the guy, knowing all this stuff that we had just described, he looks at this guy and he says this. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, or spirit, whatever one you want to put in there, right? This is the first and greatest commandment. But the second is like it. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. For upon these two commandments are built all the laws and the commandments, the rules, the prophets, the fence commandments, the Torah commandments. Upon those two. Everything else is built. Basically what Jesus was saying is this. If we, if you will just love God with everything that you are, if you will just want what God wants more than what you want, if you would just live your life the way God wants you to live it rather than the way you want to live it, you're going to be okay. You're, you've got this mostly figured out. But Jesus puts an even finer point on it. He doesn't just stop with this one first greatest commandment because he understood that it's, it's one thing to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? But the, where does the rubber meet? What does that look like? So he puts a finer point on the, most, the greatest commandment. He said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, if you want to know what it looks like or how practically, what is the practical application of loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, the practical application is Treat other people the way you want to be treated. Oh my gosh. 613 commandments. Hundreds of other fence commandments. Love God with all that you are and just treat people the way you'd want to be treated. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I think only God could do that. Now I want to stop right there for just a second and remind you of something. I don't think anywhere in the scripture or anywhere in the scriptures entirety, I don't think Jesus, especially in this scripture, was implying that there's one thing wrong with the 613 commandments found in the Torah. In fact, we know that that's not what he's doing because he said he didn't come to do away with the law, he came to fulfill the law. So he wasn't implying that there's anything wrong with the 613 commandments found in the Torah. I would even go so far as to suggest that he wasn't saying that there's anything wrong with the rabbinical or the, or the fence commandments either. They, had, they, were for, they were there for a purpose. They were meant to give some clarity and protection. Even the silly one about the rope and the donkey had a purpose. Really what I think was going on here was this. In his powerful, profound, and simple way, Jesus was trying to say, listen to me. I know that life is complicated. I know that there are nuances. I know that there will always be things that happen that will cause you to, to wonder and that you'll want to fix and try to take care of and try to stop from happening again. There will always be that. You can never come up with enough laws and rules and regulations. But there is a better way. It's not that there's anything wrong with that, but you can become so caught up in the minutia that you can forget why they're there in the first place. You see, if only we would remember why we 
you're going to be okay. So what is the why? Why, do you, why would you need all these rules and regulations? Okay. Because I am called to love God with everything that I am. That's why all those rules and regulations are in place. To remind me that I am called to love God with everything that I am. And the practical application is to love Randy like I love myself. It's not rocket science. We try to make it rocket science. We'll come up with hundreds of volumes and libraries of rules and regulate this. It's not that complicated. Love God with all that you are and treat others the way you want to be treated. And we'll be okay. All right. Put a pin in that for just a second. You don't have to yell it out, but I want you to think. How many of you remember the mission statement of Prairie Bible Church? Tom quoted it earlier this morning. Let me, let me share with you what it is, conceptually. We are called to be a simple and authentic representation or reflection of Jesus. Jesus' is love. We are called to be a simple and authentic reflection of Jesus. Now let me tell you something. In the coming weeks, months, and years, we will literally come up with thousands of ways to live out that mission statement. Or I hope we do. But I'm telling you right now, in, in living out that, that mission statement in thousands of different ways, we will also have thousands of different ways to veer off course. Because it will create nuance and complexity. And so, if only we could remember three little words. I meant to bring up one of those cups. But if you see the coffee, our coffee cups back on the, on the back table, three little words will, no matter where we go or how our mission manifests itself, if we can remember three little words, we're going to be okay. What are they? Simple, authentic Jesus. It's not rocket science.